Here's the process I use for sealing uh, small uh, 7 and 9 pin soft glass tubes uh, on, uh, on the lit and lathe here. Um, preheating the, uh, the stem holder, the button holder, uh, needs to be up. Not, not that hot, but, but warm enough that it won't shock, uh, shock the glass uh, pin seal when you go to heat the, heat the bulb. Uh, and then below, uh, obviously, this is just a just a uh, just a regular Harbor Freight torch with the uh, air shut off, so it's as bushy of a flame as you can get out of this thing. And then uh, I also have the fire carriage uh, burners, just at a very minimal gas-only flame. That's just to provide, really, just a place to light things from. Tubes this small, it's, these burners are far too large. Uh, I use. Uh, one of the uh, one of the little micro torches uh, for doing the, the main seal with this, but um, uh, either rate, uh, it goes pretty well. I'll do a uh, I'll do a, a uh, just a just a spud here first before I actually seal the tubes that are actually built. So this should be hot enough now. We'll go ahead and shut this off and put some uh, gloves on here for the one side and shut the lathe down, take the fire carriage a little out of the way so we don't burn ourselves, and position the holder to where it makes some sense. Now if you're quick enough, uh, obviously don't have a glove on, this is a spud so I'm not worrying about poisoning it, but uh, go ahead and get the stem in there. I like to leave a little bit of a gap between the, uh, between the stem and the holder just to allow a little bit of expansion and contraction. Uh, if this was on a carousel style sealer, you would put it all the way down, but then you'd have burners constantly going to stabilize the temperature. Bring it just about to flush. Kick it back on. Get our flame over there. Uh, sealing, you want to bump up, uh, bump up the speed a bit. And uh, then just going to start uh, again with the uh, with the soft flame, you just want to heat the uh, heat the assembly as uh, gently as possible, and let that go for uh, for a while. You'll actually see uh, in the uh, uh, in the area there. Uh, you'll see that the flame condition on the glass will will change a little when the glass starts getting hot. And uh, that's when you know that uh, that you're good to uh, to start uh, with the seal. Uh, of course, the nice thing about a lit and lathe is you can adjust uh, you can adjust very accurately the position of the materials. And after a while, I'm using uh, 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 hydrogen, so it's it's burning, but you can't really see the flame uh, because uh, it's just cleaner and it doesn't. Uh, doesn't uh, cloud the uh, glass. So we'll go ahead and now we'll heat with a reasonably high hydrogen flow. <clears throat> and at this point it's pretty critical to get your gas flow right uh, too much obviously and you're going to be heating too much of the glass and you'll, you'll have a wonky looking seal. Uh, not enough and you'll be sitting there forever waiting for it to seal and it won't really thermally stabilized, but uh, after a while of that, go ahead and, and uh, bring your flame up to sealing temperature. And it should quickly uh, should quickly come to sealing temperature. Just a little bit of a paddling there. You don't want to over paddle this little stuff. Just bring it to seal temperature. And when the seal goes clear, you know you got it. And back off the oxygen. <clears throat> and in a relatively rapid fashion, you want to get the soft flame back on it. Because now begins the annealing process. This one darkened a little bit. Uh, it's not uncommon on the first, uh, first seal of the day, and you haven't quite gotten your timings right yet, to uh, to uh, have a discolored seal, uh, but uh, you want to make sure that it's lightly uh, brushed with flame. 
uh, for a while. And I'm using a, a tub annealer behind the camera here. So as soon as this comes off, I'll, uh, I'll run it over, uh, run it over to that, dunk it in, and uh, and let it uh, let it sit until the entire batch is done. This particular one uh, came out. Uh, seal area is a little large, uh, which means I had a little too much gas uh, in the uh, in the torch for sealing. But nevertheless, it'll probably survive. Alright, we went off, put our torches back underneath the holder, take our tube out, and go over and drop her in the tub annealer, and on to the next one. Get our spin going again here speed down. I don't like running the lathe at, at, at high speeds for long periods of time. It, it really does wear wear out the, the uh, spline shaft and the, and the timing chains. They don't like high speed if, you know, only want to run the speed you need during the sealing operation itself because that's, that's pretty quick. Really, at this point, uh, hand oils, all, all they're really going to do is um, just create a little area of discoloration inside the tube. All, all the poisons, they're going to they're be cooked away during the bake out on the tube. Alright, that should be sufficiently warm. Shut her down. Position her. Take an tube mount. Our flames out of the way. You do have to be reasonably quick because the temperature heat from the holder will, of course, go through the pins and into the button and burn you. If you're not very quick, but a certain amount of burn is okay. There we go. Bring our heat back over. And go to about a moderate speed there and begin heating the assembly. Now with an actual uh, uh, tube in there, the, the, the uh, mount in there, the parts are going to suck away an appreciable amount of heat from the, uh, from the stem much faster, so you have to be much more judici judicious in, uh, in heating. You can't you can't just pile the heat on unless you'll get a uh, thermal sink, an even thermal sink, and, uh, and shatter the button, which happens anyways, you know, about <laughs> five times with these little parts. Soft glass is very unforgiving when you're doing things in low, uh, low quantities. Much easier to work with non-X or harder glasses, but soft glass is much easier to get your hands on. And significantly cheaper. Right. So again, heating will come up to ceiling speed. About half the speed. I run about half the speed that the lathe will run. And let's go ahead and. Come up to ceiling temperature. seal looks much better. Get our 
soft flame. And I like to back it out. As soon as everything's solid, I like to back it out of the uh, of the holder uh, because um, <clears throat> uh, I don't like the idea of having such a thermal sink. Uh, the big piece of metal, which is still at a moderate temperature, that, that could be bad. But uh, uh, you want to uh, obviously heat the, heat the pins too. Don't forget the metal pins. Is they're conducting heat at a much faster rate than the glass is conducting heat. So you really just want to use the, the flickery edge of the flame really for doing this sort of stuff. Never want to re-overheat at this point because uh, you, you'd probably just immediately shatter the glass. Anything between the strain point and the anneal point is, is the danger zone. Of course, an automated machine does all this in about a minute and a half. Uh, I've got one machine, a little machine I've got will actually do this in, gosh, about not even 90 seconds. <clears throat> Moving quite a bit slower here because the camera's in the way. Hopefully, you don't shatter on our needle from that previous one we put in there is still in one piece. So that's that. At the end of an eel, I'll, I'll show you. Hopefully we have uh, all our tubes survive. So here's the four tubes. They uh, all four appear to have survived. That's what the seal will look like on a proper seal. Those first two that I did uh, came out a little, uh, little wonky, but the rest of them all, all turned out fine. They all did seal. And uh, now we're on the, on the small uh, evacuation station uh, from uh, I got from MU Incorporated, one of the ones I used to take care of there. Pretty pretty straightforward uh, temperature controller, uh, mechanical pump switch on the left, diffusion pump in the middle, and bake out oven on the right. And it's just uh, eight ports. Um, hard to see there, eight ports compression ports with O-ring seals in there, and then a, uh, a uh, ion uh, gauge controller there, and real simple, uh, real simple valving, and then uh, the wires for hooking up the filaments. But uh, basic, uh, basic procedure for doing this would be to connect the tubes to the manifold and perform a quick, uh, quick go no go leak test. And as you can see, our primary color is, is whitish blue. I am applying, uh, oh, camera doesn't like that, I'm applying uh, water vapor. That one has a little bit of pink in it. That, that concerns me a little bit. That, that might be, uh, might be um, um, uh, air uh, leaking in. It also could be, um, could be I, I see down down in the lower portion there. I see where it's breaking down. It could be taking carbon dioxide uh, or carbon gas rather from the uh, from the cathode uh, uh, emission based uh, coating. So we'll see when we kick when we kick it on and kick the uh, ion gauge on. If it, if it goes down, then it's it's fine. It's gas being evolved from something else. But generally speaking, at this point, and it's sitting at about 10 micron pressure because it's just on the four pump. Uh, it'll uh, it'll it'll be uh, you know primarily white, uh, bluish white, which is uh, water vapor uh, coming off the glass. But let's go ahead here and we'll, we'll close the uh, close the four line off from the manifold, and we'll go ahead and uh, open up the diffusion pump inlet. And already I see on the uh, back there is a thermocouple gauge meter. I already see that going down. And that'll bottom out. And I bet you if we go up here and do our spark tests, yeah, see already we're we're almost almost down off the bottom of the scale for a, for a discharge. Another another 10 seconds or so, and probably won't be able to see anything. As a matter of fact, let's give that a try. Yeah, where we're just down to Corona discharge. Yeah, it's just Corona discharge. Eh, it's still a little bit of 
the, the tubes on this far end of the manifold are, are at a little higher pressure than the ones at the other end just from transmittance because this, this only uses half inch copper pipe as the manifold itself. But we'll go ahead and uh, we'll kick on the ion gauge here and see what we got. And it comes on and we're at the low end of the negative four scale. So that's fine. There's, there's, no, there's no leaks there. That's uh, probably, uh, like I was saying, just something breaking down inside. But we'll soon take care of that. Kick the heat on and come back in about, oh, 30 minutes or so and uh, well, maybe a little longer. Um, the cycle heat up and cool down is about 90 minutes. Uh, these I don't I don't do a true anneal on these because uh, we use the tub annealer. I, I bake these at, at 700 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is plenty enough to drive off the water vapor and uh, and the uh, uh, pull most of the binder out of the cathode material. Sometimes I'll go ahead and, and do a quick uh, RF bombardment before bake but I sprayed the cathodes really heavily on these uh, to see what effect they would have on emissions so I, I prefer to, to go ahead and, and let the more gentle heat of the uh, bake out oven do its thing because uh, the RF bombarder heats so rapidly that it could uh, blow off the uh, emission coating. Alrighty, I'll, I'll be back in a bit. Just wanted to quickly show you the uh, parts that go into the uh, these little tubes and uh, what I do it with. Uh, real simple, little Unitech spot welder there, another one down there with uh, with the handheld uh, piece here. A couple of little welding jaws for making the little filament and fiddly connections. But the uh, the actual uh, mounts, uh, I just kind of do them by hand. I uh, make the make wrap the little anodes by hand, weld them, and laser cut the mica spacers and. Uh, Spray the cathodes. These are uh, the, this is a, a batch that has much more coating on it. Give it a little experiment and uh, preform the little leads on the on the buttons and stick it all together. I use uh, you know one of these little pin straighteners to hold it. That's a different that's a different tube. That's a six feet six C four guts there and uh, weld them together and test fit them in a in a bulb here and uh, and they're ready to to go out and seal. Uh, grids uh, I make on a uh, machine out in the garage, a, a Logan grid lathe uh, that makes them in strips and you cut and prepare each one individually and then uh, clean and fire them and then they're ready for uh, ready for mounting and uh, and processing. But it's a pretty, uh, pretty hand labor intensive process uh, uh, not too different from what most of the commercial manufacturers are doing. Some add more higher levels of automation uh, and of course they they stamped everything all the parts were stamped they weren't formed by hand but just experimenting uh, it's, it, I can't afford to make stamp tools for anodes and things like that it's completely unaffordable for a hobbyist point of view but uh, either rate uh, I just do a few at a time and that's that's good enough for me as uh, some other projects I've done uh, use pill bottles to hold the fiddly bits but uh, a little collection of the various bulbs that I have on hand uh, to see what fits in what and some some uh, mount assemblies of, of various other projects, some more successful than others, and these are some stems. I was I was trying my hand at at, at making a large uh, hard glass stem, and they they darkened the gas conditions weren't quite right, uh, so I didn't work out. And some other little little tubes here that I was <clears throat> working with. These are uh, these were tubes I was making for. Uh, uh, I was trying to make. Uh, grounded grid linear amplifier tubes and they, they do work uh, but uh, uh, I just you know only fiddle with that when I feel like playing with radio but uh, at either rate uh, I'll go show you the grid winder here is a uh, Logan grid winding lathe sorry for all the all the junk here wasn't planning on filming this thing tonight but uh, it makes uh, grid lengths there we go I found a much larger one to easier uh, to more easily illustrate this uh, by carrying a pair of uh, side rods there at uh, this happens to be 30 thousandths diameter uh, nickel rod drawn across a mandrel on focus on that in there a very small 
Very hard piece of steel there, ground to the profile. The upper wheel, as it turns, uh, it puts a notch in the side rod, which the uh, grid wire itself is laid into. And on a subsequent revolution, the lower wheel peens that notch, locking the wire into place. It is drawn out uh, by <clears throat> this draw bar, which has a clamp on the end, governed by a lead screw and that's driven by a set of back gears so this will actually this can actually be set to run either in or out to give you either uh, finer or coarser turns than the lead screw will allow then that in turn drives a set of, uh, of reduction gears back here which drives a cam which sets the timing for the cutting and peening wheels to be raised or lowered which allow for areas of the winding to be loose so they can be subsequently removed as they have been on this one. Then this piece would be put in a guillotine, oh I'm sorry, missed a step. That would then be stretched with this contraption, locked in at both ends, and pulled ever so slightly to straighten the grid out, just like that. Then it would be put in a guillotine, which is a a uh, pedal uh, operated uh, guillotine which then would slice these into the individual uh, grid pieces uh, and uh, also too in there they profile the actual guillotine itself this one's not on this side but to be able to stagger uh, stagger the uh, the ends let's see if I can find an example of that here here we are there's an example uh, stagger the ends uh, to make them easier for insertion uh, and uh, then cut them to the individual lengths and then you're ready to uh, clean, uh, fire, and install them in the tubes. Um, let's see, you can see here, Logan Engineering. I, I contacted them at some point. Uh, uh, Harold Ulmer, uh, the uh, founder of MU, got in contact with them. Uh, there was uh, some miscommunication to the company in the early 70s when they finally tossed out all this stuff. Uh, the, these machines are, uh, were made in the, in the very early 50s and then they were actually considered obsolete. Automatic machines had largely replaced them by then. But in the early 70s, Harold contacted uh, Logan, was able to get a hold of one of the principal people there that knew where everything was and, and sure enough they uh, uh, Harold was able to buy uh, the entire remaining stock of, of replacement and service parts for these things, which, which I now have. I, have. I have a pair of these machines and all of the service and replacement parts that Logan had left at that time. And, uh, and I had to, uh, when, I, when I, I, I purchased these machines uh, out, of, out of the remnants of MU, and uh, I, uh, I uh, promised that I would keep these things in, in functional condition. Believe it or not, it's actually cleaner than it was sitting there. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, just because probably the only two of this old of a machine that's not an RCA machine uh, still in existence and, and functional. So uh, uh, they're, they're, they're difficult to set up and kind of hard to run, but there's nothing else that does what, what really what these machines do, uh, uh, being as universal as they are and can be set up in a wide, wide array of, of doing things. They're really only good for small grids, though. Big grids like big, big power triodes and stuff is not suitable for that. Uh, I, I can make stuff this size, uh, but uh, that's about as big as it gets, and that's that's not even the size of a of a 45 grid. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, this is just for, for just small receiving tubes. But uh, either way, it, uh, it 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 works fairly well if you have the patience to to get it to run. See if I can get a little better shot of this tip off my hand out of the way here. So we'll very gradually heat the area. This will not cause any thermal shock. A very bushy flame. And sharpen up the flame a bit. is you just 
simply have to commit to it. The tube is coming off no matter what. And that's it. Now we have a uh, sealed tube. A little bit, a little bit of heat. And, uh, and there you go. The uh, tube is now uh, and, and the biggest question I get is, when does the tube now considered to have a vacuum in it? Well, it now has a vacuum in it. It is a tube, it's sealed up, but it's not the ultimate vacuum. For that, we go over and we need to flash the getter, which we will do on this induction heater. And already powered up and running so take the tube still hot off the pump put it in our induction coil here we heat the getter ring and the barium evaporates flashes and we have a uh, flashed vacuum tube on its way down to its ultimate pressure which is going to be oh at least down on the negative seven scale probably even lower and I'll just do the whole world in there now it's critical to not over flash them uh, because you can actually ruin the barium and, uh, and that ain't no fun. A lot of the uh, Russian tubes are overflashed, and they're a little, uh, a little bit burned in appearance. You can also soft flash the tubes, uh, leaving some unevaporated barium if you're uh, doing some uh, experimentation. Uh, leaving some reserve for uh, for later. Uh, that one there, for example, I, I soft a little, a little, I flashed a little soft. Uh, can't can't really uh, on, focus. Can't really tell. Uh, but uh, after uh, after aging and uh, uh, breakdown of the uh, of the oxide barium oxide to. Uh, to uh, 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 barium metal, uh, it liberates a fair amount of oxygen, and you can start to see that flash go soft. So then you you reinforce it with another shot, and it kind of can work as a bit of a diagnostic tool. And here's the result: four tubes uh, ready for aging and testing. I'll, uh, it's getting a little late now, but uh, tomorrow, uh, hopefully, or over the weekend, I'll get around to properly testing them and see what I've uh, see what I've got here but uh, I'd like to uh, like to thank uh, uh, Miss uh, Ronnie uh, Ellsbury uh, Ulmer uh, Harold Ulmer's daughter uh, she's uh, the one who was good enough to let me go down for oh gosh uh, almost 20 years and uh, and uh, work down at her shop and help take care of that place a little part of history and uh, now, of course, uh, uh, the, most of the assets of MU are in the hands of a, a new owner who are uh, deliberating what they want to do with it. But uh, nevertheless, I'm just going to carry on uh, doing my little hobby stuff here. And uh, when I build the bigger shop, uh, be able to do some more uh, elaborate things. But uh, hope this was informative, and thanks for watching.